Good morning, everyone. Welcome to church. Yes, praise the Lord. Great day. We're going to start with some songs. This morning, let's open up in prayer. Thank the Lord Jesus for this day. Lord, we just thank you for this day. We just commit this service into your hands, Lord. We invite the Holy Spirit to come and speak to our hearts this morning as Eric preaches. Lord, we just thank you for this time. In Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. All right, let's start with a song, Mick. It's my Lighthouse. We're doing songs a bit differently. In my it? wrestling, oh, in, in my doubts, in, in my failures, you won't walk out. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Oh, you are the peace. In my trouble sea In the silence you won't let go In the questions your truth will hold Your great love will lead me through You are the peace in my trouble sea oh, You are the peace in my trouble sea So we're using that for a little while to help us with our music. I like it. <laughs> uh, we're going to go to the next one, I, I think, which is I Believe. I believe there is one salvation. One doorway that leads to life One redemption, one confession I believe in the name of Jesus Christ I believe in the crucifixion By His blood I have been set 
of our series on signs of the times because we had a, a break for Father's Day last week. But if you remember, this is looking at what Jesus had to say to the disciples. On, it's called the Olivet Discourse. But they had been in Jerusalem and he'd been talking to the, uh, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. He'd been talking to everybody. And on the way out, the disciples said, oh, aren't those... Aren't the buildings magnificent? Isn't the temple beautiful? And he said, look, it's going to be wiped away. It's going to be destroyed. So they asked him two questions. They said, when is the temple going to be destroyed? And when's the end of the world? Now, perhaps they were thinking that it would be the same time. But Jesus answered these two questions. And we were looking at the first two uh, sermons about the destruction of Jerusalem. And he was saying very clearly, look, these are the 
clear signs that the temple is going to be destroyed, Jerusalem's going to be destroyed, when you see the armies gathering around them, when you see the um, desecration of the temple, then you know it's going to happen straight away, get out. But there's a bit of confusion sometimes with the end of the world part. Because Jesus talks about this will happen in this generation. But we might think of a generation of those people who are all born at the same time. But that isn't what Jesus was talking about. When um, in Matthew's gospel, Jesus talks about this generation five times. And it's all on the same day. So it's not like he meant one thing one day and months later he's talking about it. It's all on the one day. He's, he's talking about this generation. And it's important because we can sometimes think, well, why would he say that? Did he make a mistake? Um, is it relevant what he says to us? Or was that only relevant to the disciples? So it's important to understand what he meant. So uh, let's have a look at one of those other times. This is just before uh, they walked out of Jerusalem when he was talking to the, the, the Pharisees. And Mick, if I could have the Matthew 23. And this is him talking to the, say, uh, the Pharisees. Therefore... I'm sending you prophets and wise men and teachers of religious law, but you'll kill some by crucifixion and you'll flog others with whips in your synagogues, chasing them from the city. As a result, you will be held responsible for the murder of all godly people of all time, from the murder of righteous Abel to the murder of Zechariah, son of Barakiah. That's the, the last murder recorded in the Old Testament whom you killed in the temple between the sanctuary and the altar. I tell you the truth, this judgment will fall on this very generation. So Jesus is blaming them for the death of someone 800 years ago, the death of another person uh, 3,000 years previous, three or four he said, look, you're all the one generation. You're all the one generation. And he calls them, listen, you're snakes. You're sons of vipers. What's he thinking here? Well, let's get back to Genesis. Genesis chapter 3. I will cause hostility between you and the woman. This is Jesus talking to the devil, Satan. And between your offspring and her offspring, he will strike your head and you will strike his heel. So while we think of a generation as people all born at the same time, Jesus is thinking we're either God's offspring or we're Satan's offspring. And that all throughout history, people have to be one or the other. So it's not coming at the same time. It's where you come from. Whether you're Satan's offspring, whether you're God's offspring. And from the Garden of Eden right up to the end of time, there will be these two groups. You're either a child of God or you're a child of the devil. So, Jesus goes on to talk about the sign of uh, his second coming, of when he's coming back. And unlike the bit about Jerusalem, this is a bit vague. He says, there will be a sign in the heavens when I'm coming back. And that's it. So, maybe it looks like this. Maybe if you could imagine you get up one morning and there's a new planet just looming over the earth. Maybe it's something like that. We don't know because it doesn't say. But what we do know is that 
it will be obvious. No one's going to go out the door and say, oh, that's a little unusual. No, they're going to go out and they're going to be stunned. And um, those of us who are part of God's family will be pleased because we know Jesus is coming back. And those of us who are not will be horrified and will be mourning because they'll know that the judgment is coming upon them. So there's a sign coming. It will be obvious. It will be unexpected. Jesus went on to say, look, nobody knows when. I don't know when. Part of him becoming human like us, coming to the earth, meant that he didn't know this. Only God the Father knew this. So he said, look, it's unexpected. And he gave a couple of examples of uh, unexpected things. So he talked about Noah and how the destruction came to the people, even though Noah had been preaching for a year or over it, uh, for quite some time. It was still a surprise to them. They were just living their ordinary lives and suddenly the judgment of the flood came upon them. And he said, look, any house owner, if they knew when the burglar was going to turn up, they could take steps. But you don't. The time is unexpected. So, So it is with us. And with Jesus coming back, we have to take into account that we have to always be ready. And so he told some stories, some some parables, and uh, we'll look at a couple of them briefly and one in a bit more detail. So this is what Jesus had to say. However, no one knows the day or hour when these things will happen. Not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself, only the Father knows. So you too must keep watch, for you don't know what day your Lord is coming. Understand this, if a burglar, homeowner knew exactly when a burglar was coming, he would keep watch and not permit his house to be broken into. You must also be ready all the time. For the Son of Man will come when least expected. So what do we do? What do we do in this... At this period when we don't know when it will end, how long it will go on for, how do we live? Well, the first thing he said was, look, a master is going away... What do they want of their, their servants, their slaves? He said, they want someone reliable who will feed and look after the other servants and will get on with the, looking after his master's things. But what happens if a servant decides, ah, oh, who knows when the master's coming back, I don't have to worry about that. And he starts mistreating the other servants. He starts getting drunk and partying, goofing off, When the master comes back, he won't be pleased. So that's the first thing that we have to do as we wait for Jesus to come back is remember that it will happen at some time and to care for those around us. Second parable we're going to look at a bit more deeply. It's the the parable of the ten bridesmaids. Now, my daughter Sarah got married earlier in the year and she had five bridesmaids. A few years back, Rachel got married, she had six bridesmaids. It wasn't actually their choice, actually the grooms decided this. They wanted so many groomsmen so you have to match. But I can tell you, well, the thought of ten bridesmaids is a little unnerving. <laughs> um, and being the father, I have a different role but... I can assure you, um, the idea of getting ten bridesmaids, making sure that they have their hair done and their clothes and their makeup 
and they're in the right place and they're there for the photos. Um, Janet tells me, not a good thought. <laughs> okay, let's have a look at the first five, five verses. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten bridesmaids who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The five who were foolish didn't take enough olive oil for their lamps, but the other five were wise enough to take along extra oil. When the bridegroom was to slay, dis when the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. And we'll stop it there. So they did things differently. Um, Got to say, even now, my daughters did things differently to us, <laughs> to uh, when we got married. Um, I mean, we knew when they were going to get engaged. It was it was all planned out, and and we knew to the <laughs> to the day when they were going to get engaged. Um, didn't happen that way with us, and um, I know when I told my father-in-law uh, and my mother-in-law to be, um, they were surprised. In fact, shocked and horrified might have been a better uh, <laughs> um, description of it. But we knew beforehand because uh, they do it differently. They do it differently. Anyway, in these days, and what's described here, the people around would have understood. So a marriage took place in three steps. You had the engagement and the fathers of the bride and groom, sometimes the mother might have been involved, but they would get together and they would arrange, okay, yes, yes, that's okay, you got the money, everything's sorted out and they would say, we approve. It was all organised. You'd have the engagement. Then you'd have something called the betrothal and that was like the engagement party and they'd exchange gifts, celebrate and so forth and they wouldn't move in together at that point. They'd still be living separately. But it was a bit more than our engagement in that if it was broken off for some reason you'd actually have to go through a divorce. So that's the point where Mary and Joseph were when Mary discovered she was pregnant with Jesus. They were betrothed. And then about a year later was the actual wedding. And what would happen was the groom would come to the bride's family house with his friends, his groomsmen, and he'd turn up the door and say, oh, I've come to, come to take your daughter away. Now, if the parents had come to the door and said, oh, thank God, let's get rid of her, I think the groom might have thought, um, <laughs> is there something wrong? <laughs> because that didn't happen. What happened was they said, oh, come in. Oh, we can't, we can't bear to give up our wonderful daughter. Oh, no. Oh, no. Here, have a cup of tea. Have a cup of coffee. Have some biscuits. Um, oh, she's got to stay with us a bit longer. And they would do various ceremonies and they'd get out the photo album. Well, it wasn't actually a photo album, but they'd tell stories about, you know. <laughs> they'd do anything they could to delay it to show how much they loved her. They didn't want to, they didn't want to let her go. So that's why the bridegroom was de delayed. Because that was the normal thing. You knew full well, if you're amongst the bridesmaids group, that it could be any length of time before the happy couple actually turned up. So what the bridesmaids would do is they would be waiting along the, the road between the two parents' houses. And when eventually the bridegroom... And the bride, the bride's not really mentioned in this story because it's the bridesmaids who represent the church, whereas usually 
is the bride that represents the church. This story is the other way around. They would come along, they would join the procession with their lamps and so forth, and they would go to the groom's house, and they'd all go inside, and then have the wedding reception, the big party thing. So that's where we are here. We've got the ten bridesmaids, standard number for that occasion, and they're waiting along the way. And they doze off. Nothing really significant in that. Both the wise ones and the foolish ones dozed off because they're waiting a long while. <coughs> so, oh, can we go back? There should be another verse there. Okay. At midnight, they were roused by the shout, Look, the bridegroom is coming. Come out and meet him. All the bridesmaids got up and prepared their lamps. Then the five foolish ones asked the others, um, please give us some of your oil because our lamps are going out. But the others replied, we don't have enough for all of us. Go to a shop and buy some for yourselves and we'll stop there. So these ten bridesmaids, this is the point where we realise that half of them, or some, some of them, are smart and some of them are dumb. Some of them have prepared and others haven't. Up until that point, you couldn't tell them apart. They all looked apart, the they were all in the right place, they'd all uh, got the capacity to do their, their job as a bridesmaid. They had their, their lamps with them. But at this point, there's a lack on one side. They haven't brought the oil. For us as Jesus followers, we have to we have to look at ourselves and think, are we spiritually prepared for Jesus coming again? For the bridegroom coming? Can we light the way? Do we have the spiritual resources? Sometimes, sometimes people appear to be doing the right thing, to be religious, but it's not in their hearts. That relationship of saving grace isn't in their hearts. If we look at Isaiah 55, that's all about God's saving grace and it starts off, come, come and buy from me without money. Take water, take milk. And God's saying, look, I will provide what you need. You don't need to buy it. You don't need to earn it. You just have to accept it. And the foolish ones haven't done that. They hadn't bought without price from God. They hadn't accepted his saving grace. They hadn't become his children. And they didn't have his spirit in their hearts. Let's have a look at the last few verses of that. While they were gone to buy oil, the bridegroom came. Then those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast and the door was locked. Later, when the other five bridesmaids returned, they stood outside calling, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he called back, believe me, I don't know you. So, we too must keep watch, for you do not know the day or the hour of my return. Before Jesus comes back, the door is open. The door is open to heaven. And we can come in to the feast to celebrate with him in heaven, provided we have taken his saving grace that we have 
accepted God the Father as our Father, that we have his spirit in our lives. But there will come a time when Jesus returns and the door is shut. The opportunity is not there anymore. And for each of us, it's not only when Jesus comes back because death can take us at any time. Maybe an accident, maybe a sudden disease and then it's too late. It's too late to be adopted into God's family. It's too late to be forgiven. It's too late to have his life poured into our hearts. So we must be ready. We must be prepared now. And that's how we live with the spectre of our own mortality, with the promise of Christ's return. Jesus had one more parable. And he said, look, a man was going away for a long while, so he called his servants together. He had three servants, and he gave one of them five bags of silver. And he gave another one two bags of silver, and another one one bag of silver. Because he figured they had different capabilities, I'll entrust them with these things. When he eventually came back, the one who'd been given five said, look, I've invested it, I've done things with it, and here's five more. Now you've got ten. The second servant said, look, I did the same thing with the two that you gave me, and now you've got four. And the third one said, well, yeah, I know you're pretty tough. Um, you're a very hard marker. Um, what I did, I just buried it in the ground so that no burglars could get it, it was safe, and here's your one bag. He said, you think I'm tough, do you? You think I'm a hard mug? Why didn't you put it in the bank? At least I get 2% on it, you know. Jesus, the master didn't believe him. He said, no, no, this is just laziness. And he said, look, he took the one... And he gave it to the one who'd been faithful with the five and now had ten. You get nothing. The third thing we should be doing is being responsible with what God has given us. The physical things, like our church buildings, like our things at home, our homes and, and, and the money we have, are we being faithful? Are we using them for God's purposes? What we know of God's love, are we using that? Are we spreading it to those around us? Are we telling them the gospel and how people can be reconciled with him? Or are we just saying, okay, I've got it. I've got it, I'll keep it to myself. And that's enough. No. So let's bring up the summary. <coughs> Jesus is coming at an unexpected time. So what should we be doing as we wait, as we look forward to his return? We should be caring for each other. We just should make sure that we are spiritually prepared for Christ's return. And we should be faithful with what has been entrusted to us, both material and spiritual. Amen. Thank you, Eric.
excellent message this morning. We're going to come to a time of reflection now, get ready and prepare our hearts for communion. Uh, so we're going to sing a little song. Thanks, Mick. have paid my ransom. Jesus has died for us, for each one of us. And because of that, we can come into the Father's arms. We can receive his grace and his mercy. So all is prepared for you. Let's share in this communion. Let's pray. Be with us, Lord Jesus. Make yourself known to us in the sharing of this bread and this grape juice, as we remember the sacrifice you made for us. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. In remembrance of all that Christ has done for us, we take this bread and we take this cup 
and we offer ourselves as a holy and living sacrifice made worthy by the perfect offering of Jesus Christ. So by your word and by your spirit, bless these gifts, Lord God, that we may truly share Christ's blood and, and body and become by grace his body given for the world. Let's say the Lord's Prayer together and it will be up on the screen if you need it. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. This is Christ's body broken for you. And this is Christ's blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. So let's receive these elements. Let's become what Christ wants us to be. And share in this Holy Communion, not because you're strong, but because you are weak and we need the Lord. Share in it not because of any goodness of your own, but because we need the mercy and grace of our Lord God. And share because he loves you and gave himself for you. So I invite Eric and Joanne if you want to distribute the elements. With the bread, take a piece and eat it to remind yourself that Christ died for you. This grape juice represents the blood that Jesus shed for us. When you take it this time, hold it and we will, we will drink it together to remind ourselves that we are part of the body of Christ.
Let's all drink together now to remember that Christ shed his blood for us. Thank you, Jesus. And we just come before the Lord now in a time of silence, just to let him, allow him to minister to us. Let's pray. Lord God, you renew us at your table with the bread of life. Let this food strengthen us in our love for your world and help us to serve you with our lives as you served us. Accept our praise and our thanks for all you have done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. just take this a moment to just thank the Lord for our tithes and offerings. Um, Father God, we lift up uh, the offering, Lord. We thank you right now, Lord Jesus, for the good things you give us, Lord, every day, each and every day. We give them back to you freely, Lord, with love and appreciation, knowing that you are a good God all the time. We ask that you will use it for your kingdom, Lord, be used wisely. Father, we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I'm doing the prayers of the people. Have we got any prayers? Mark, if you don't know, Mark got a splint yet, surely? Your neighbour. What's your neighbour's name? Terry. Terry. Oh. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. Terry, we can pray for Terry. Yes, Miller. Pamela. Oh, okay. Oh, complicated ones. Okay. Sorry? Carmen. Oh, yes. She's, yes, we'll pray for Carmen. <laughs> so that's, uh, I've got to Terry, um, Pamela, and Carmen, and Helen, yes, she's still recovering too, and Mark. <laughs> All right, let's just bow our heads, come before the Lord. Lord, we just thank you. We come before you. We're humble, Lord. Your goodness just is so amazing, Lord. When we don't deserve goodness, Lord, you came and showed us goodness, Lord. You showed us love like we have never seen, Lord, or never, will never see, Lord. And, Father, we just thank you that we can come to church freely and we can um, worship you freely without conflict, without aggression, without violence, Lord. We just thank you for that, for that privilege of our freedom, Lord, that we have in this country. Lord, may we continue to have freedom, especially when it comes to the Bible, Lord, and preaching the Bible. Lord, direct our leaders, Lord, we pray your hand be upon them and guide them, Holy Spirit. We pray for all those who just call you Lord in this country. Lord, help us to keep rising up and be a voice for good, a, go a voice for Jesus. We think of... Uh, around the world, Lord. There's such turmoil, Lord, but we know you are the answer because you are the peace, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for Israel. We thank you for her land, her people. We pray for peace in Jerusalem, Lord. We pray for the, those who love you in Israel that you will uh, keep them safe and uphold them, Lord. We pray for others, Lord, in these war-torn areas in the Middle East. 
Lord, they are seeking answers, Father. You are the answer, Lord. May they have revelation and may their eyes be open, Lord, to receive the light of Jesus, we pray. We just bring these people to you, Lord, from our church. Father, we pray for Terry, Lord. He's recovering. We pray, Father God, for a miracle in his life. We pray, Lord, that he'll get the best medical care and that, Lord, he will reach out to you and that he'll seek you, Lord. And, Father, that you will answer. I thank you, Lord. I pray for Pamela, too, with health issues, Lord. We pray that she also gets the best medical care, Father. And then we pray for a recovery, a miracle working, Lord. And we pray, Lord, that you'll just open her heart to receive the gospel, Lord, to receive Jesus. We pray for Helen, Lord, also ill, recovering. Help her to recover too, Lord. Give her the strength that she needs to recover, Lord. We think of Mark, Lord. We thank you for healing his foot and that uh, he'll be able to walk again soon, properly, without pain. We thank you for healing there. We thank you for the um, miracle that you already did, Lord, in that there was no infection, Father, in his blood or in the bone, Lord. It was completely clean. And we give you all the praise and glory for that, Lord. We thank you. Lord, others that we have not spoken here or heard of, of, said, Lord, we just say in our heart right now, and I'll give everybody just a moment to pray quietly and to ask your petitions before God. Lord, we think of Carmen, so far away from us, Lord, but we are close in heart. We pray that the Holy Spirit will do a miraculous, miraculous work in her life over there in Italy. Father, may she know that we care for her and that we are praying for her, Lord. Pray, Lord, for wisdom that she not make any rash decisions, Father, but that she'll prayerfully consider decisions that she has to make for her life, Lord. We just thank you, Father, that you bless everything she does and you'll protect her, Lord, from harsh words, from harsh people, Lord, and that you'll surround her with your angels, Father. We ask that all these people that we prayed for this morning, Lord, that your angels surround them, Lord, and may they sense your presence. We thank you, Lord. We just give you praise and glory. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Uh, next, Mick. Last song. Our last song. Look, seven minutes to spare. This is a new song. It's called Always. Pretty song. I believe you gave sight to the blind. I believe that the dead came to life. I believe there were wonders and signs, and you're still the same. I believe every word that you said. I believe there are scars in your hands, that your goodness is good without end, and you'll never change. I will tell of your wonders, sing of your grace. The God of creation knows me by name. The Lord is faithful yesterday, now and always, always. Your mercy is mighty, age after age. All generations will bow down and praise the Lord. Yesterday, now and always, always I believe you come in the clouds I believe you are here even now In your presence 
As we wait for your return, Lord Jesus, we pray this. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with us each day. May the love of the Heavenly Father sustain us. May the fellowship of the Holy Spirit warm us now and forever. Amen.